I'm going to go through a slide presentation here, and I'm not going to go into huge depth on a lot of the slides that uh, I'm going to present, but I present them to you. There's a kind of panoply of slides dealing with the challenge that we now face in American public education and making the case for why we need to t pay attention uh, to some of the kinds of things that you're working on. And in an audience like this, it's probably not necessary to belabor the problem statement. You already get it, you're already working on it. But it's important, I think, for you to get a sense in the larger national conversation about how we make the case that it's worthwhile for policymakers and funders and taxpayers to pay attention to the kinds of issues that you're grappling with in these initiatives. So that's what this presentation is really uh, designed to do. Um, thanks, Andrew. So the challenge in front of us is our school systems and our education reform conversation generally ignore, avoid, minimize, or deny the impact of poverty on student success. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about poverty here, but poverty is just a proxy for a lot of other kinds of disadvantage uh, that children bring to school. Disadvantage that may be associated with uh, disabilities, it may be associated with the lack of being a native English speaker, uh, issues of race uh, come in here, ethnicity, geography. There are a number of disadvantages that you can think of, healthcare disadvantages, which go across the board. But we all know that the kinds of issues that we see children bringing to school in the healthcare domain are associated with poverty because kids who are not from backgrounds of poverty typically have the social capital and support to take care of those issues outside of school and before they come to school. So the kids most in need of this kind of service and support through public institutions, school or other institutions, are typically children coming from backgrounds of poverty. We've been in a massive period of education reform in this country for the past 20 to 25 years. Every state, including Illinois, has been engaged in this. We set out to achieve a goal of preparing all of our students, and we said, all means all, no excuses, no exceptions, to be successful in our society. And yet after 20 plus years of working at this, there's still an iron law correlation between socioeconomic status and educational achievement and attainment. We set out to say, we're gonna build a school system that genuinely delivers on Horace Mann's old promise made in the late 19th century that we wanted our society to be a meritocracy and we wanted schools to be the great balance wheel of that society to make that happen. Give everybody a common school and then the cream would rise to the top and we'd be a meritocracy. Uh, and it's apparent that in spite of some good things that we've accomplished with education reform over the past quarter century, we still have some of the same deep, persistent achievement gaps that existed before we started. Disparate levels of outcomes throughout the system. And so what succeeds here now is a, a, a set of slides that simply demonstrate this, that si simply illustrate um, these kinds of achievement gaps. Here you see a slide, and I'm sorry for the small print, but you see uh, slides that talk about achievement gaps on the basis of race or ethnicity, on the basis of gender, and down here we get to this issue of parental background, the quote unquote zip code, and you can see it's directly related, directly correlated to parents' level of education. Here we see trends in national high school graduation rates by student group. The red is all students, the yellow is economically disadvantaged, the green students with disabilities, um, the purple, I guess it is, are English language students. Here, this showed up in the New York Times front page um, uh, about a month ago, and you see a straight line running northeast there, correlation between socioeconomic status and educational achievement and attainment. Each one of these purple dots represents one of the 14 to 15,000 school districts in the United States, and it's an interactive map. You can get it if you go to the New York Times on this, and if you touch one of those dots, you can find your school district. 
So there's sort of two stories here. As you look at the overall flow of the diagram, you can see that clear correlation that I talked about between the income of the community and the achievement of the students. However, within any given line, you can see there's an enormous range of, of achievement. So schools do matter. Nobody's suggesting here that schools don't matter or can't make a difference. Uh, within each line, they do make a difference, but the overall trend is that income actually matters more. The likelihood of being ready for school at age five by poverty status at birth. So a number of factors taken into account here, and uh, you know this from your own experience. I certainly know it from uh, having visited many kindergartens in Massachusetts, that you have a wide range of kindergarten readiness from two or three years behind to two or three years ahead. And if you separate those, that stretch into quintiles, and you follow those children through their K-12 experience through those 13 years, there's very little movement between those quintiles during K-12. So in some senses, and those of you who are believers in early education will know this, the battle's over before it even begins. Uh, so this is something we need to be concerned about. Here are national um, scale reading scores on the NAEP between those in the purple bar who are free and reduced lunch eligible and those in the red bar who are not. So significant differences. Here's the same thing on mass scores. We know this, but it's pretty stark to see it uh, like this. Taking it to Illinois, uh, here are your figures uh, on uh, the reading scores, and here's what you look like in math. I'm from Massachusetts. We're proud of our achievement rates. We lead the nation on NAEP, uh, have for the past half a dozen administrations every other year in fourth and eighth grade reading and math. Uh, no other state has led in all those categories once. We've done it uh, five times over at least now. And yet, beneath those averages, because this is all calculated on the base of averages, are those same kinds of deep persistent achievement gaps that we had before education reform began. So we're doing well, but nowhere near good enough. We've failed at our overall goal, which was to get to all means all, and so have you here in Illinois. Um, average US, US SAT score by family income, clearly the higher the income, uh, the higher the score. So there's a direct line correlation. And this has to do with support and opportunity that goes along with greater access to resources within a family. High school dropout rate, the high income rate 1.3, low income rate 5.9. U.S. high school graduation rate, high income rate 89%, low income rate 74%. Percentage of students attending a community college is their first choice after school. Um, many fewer higher income students uh, do that than lower income students. Percentage of students enrolled in a four-year college uh, requiring remedial work. Low-income students need this much more often. None of this is <clears throat> surprising, I'm sure, but it's kind of stark when you see it at every level. Percentage of students entering and completing college by income level. So <clears throat> not just entering, but completing. And you can see it here. The bottom quartile has much lower both entry and completion rates, 9% completion rate in the lowest income quartile by comparison with a 54% in the upper income quartile. And it matters a lot these days because income is more than ever before correlated <clears throat> with your education. And education is more than ever before correlated with your social capital, your family background. So the more education you get, the higher your weekly earnings are likely to be. Straight line correlation. There's even a correlation between income and life expectancy in the United States, and that shows you um, the correlation here. The higher your income, uh, the, more, the longer you're likely to live. So behind the unequal incomes, 
Uh, the unequal outcomes are income-based gaps in opportunities and life experiences <clears throat> and supports. Uh, we're, you're talking about ACEs today at this event, and here's the likelihood of people having experienced ACEs. The red line is if you're from an upper income background. The blue line or purple line is if you're from a lower income background. Much higher likelihood of incidences for obvious reasons. <clears throat> Percentage of children aged three to six years in U.S. center-based daycare. Uh, much higher if you um, have access to, to more income. So we know it starts in early childhood. Some kids have great opportunities uh, in early childhood for early education and care, others don't. Uh, you all probably know about the, uh, the word gap. By age three, there's a 30 million word gap between a welfare family and a professional family. By age five, it's about 50 million before they even get to kindergarten. And yet we have a system that doesn't really treat that. It acts as though everybody coming into kindergarten is more or less the same, when clearly their experience is different. It may be the same in aptitude, but we're not talking about aptitude. We're talking about what their experience has been, what, what learning opportunities they've had, and hearing words is a learning opportunity. Percentage of high school students enrolled in college preparatory curriculum. Well, no wonder the college going and college success rates are lower because low-income students have a less than half of the preparation that high-income students have for going to college. The International Baccalaureate is just one indicator of a high-test college readiness curriculum, <clears throat> and here are the respective percentages of people who get a shot in this country at that kind of curriculum. Family enrichment expenditures. Well, we know 80% of a child's waking hours between the ages of kindergarten and grade 12, those 13 years, are spent outside of school. 20% of their waking hours spent in school. By the time you calculate for after school, weekends, holidays, vacations, and summer. So we're asking schools on 20% of the time to deliver a 100% equity solution. It turns out to be too much to ask. It turns out that schools alone, as currently constituted, aren't capable of doing the job that society is asking them to do. And here's one of the reasons. Because outside of school, those of us who have privilege and have advantage are doing everything we possibly can to enrich the lives of our children outside of school. And we're spending increasingly more money than lower income folks are able to spend on those endeavors. And we have more time to do it, and they have less time to do it, since it's harder and harder to make ends meet in our society. So that looks like how that ratio is going, and you can see you know, about six times greater in an affluent family, and that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of social capital and opportunities. Here's one of the most important ones and one of my favorite ones to talk about, which is the summer learning gap. I'm on a campaign now to, that we ought to be thinking about an entitlement to high-quality summer learning as, in effect, a third semester of our education system. Not as something optional, not as an accident of birth, but something that every child has access to. Because privileged children regularly have access to it by accident of birth, by what their families do for them. I have a 14-year-old daughter, as old as I am, and I still <laughs> plan, her summer is like a uh, patchwork quilt of different kinds of learning opportunities, ranging from summer camps, to tutoring, to horseback riding, to travel, to meeting all kinds of interesting people, all these things she constantly stimulated and enriched. She actually goes to an urban school system in Massachusetts where she's side by side with a lot of low-income youngsters, one of whom <clears throat> might quite likely live in a poor neighborhood in our city, <coughs> excuse me, have a working mom who needs to go to work uh, during the day, is afraid of having that child out in the neighborhood, has no access to high-quality summer learning opportunities, says you have to stay in the apartment. Basically, that child has a uh, television set and a bag of potato chips, and that's the day. So why would anybody think these two kids are going to come out the same at the end of a summer of this experience, let alone 13 summers in a row, let alone that's a proxy for what happens after school and weekends and so forth? 
What we know is, during the regular school year, irrespective of the quality of schools, poor kids and wealthier kids in their respective schools progress at roughly the same rate. The line is roughly equal. And then in the summer, poor kids lose some ground in the lot with the lack of stimulation. Wealthier kids are stimulated and move ahead. And so by the time you start next year, you're, you're wider apart than you were. And this continues. So we have undeniable, irrefutable evidence of the value of summer learning, and yet we haven't made policy to make this an entitlement yet. We say, well, it's just an accident of birth. Either you get it or you don't. This is something with a family. We don't really mess with that. But if we're serious about all means all, we have to do something about that. So that's, that's um, sort of one of the elements of what we think has to be a new 21st century system for educating and preparing our children for success. So why does all this that I've shown you matter at all? And imagine you're just a business person out in the audience or a philanthropist or somebody. Why, why should we care about this? Well, one thing is we've got a very much changing, as you know, demographic of who's in the public schools. So we've just gone over half of our kids um, uh, coming from low-income backgrounds. Of the 55 or so million children in U.S. public schools, more than half of them come from low-income backgrounds. At the same time, we have a majority minority, if you will, if that's even a term. Students of color are now the majority of students in U.S. public schools. Well, historically, these are two groups with whom, in public education, we've not done a great job of educating to high levels at scale. So this now becomes the majority of our system and if it wasn't a concern before for moral reasons, which it always should have been, it ought to be a concern now for practical reasons, because that's our future. Here's a trend in the percent of Illinois students eligible for free or reduced price meals. Just, between, just in the last five years, it's increased by 6%. So this is the work, just briefly, that we're set out to do uh, Tom mentioned the Education Redesign Lab, and I'll just give you our theory of action and the kind of work we're, we're engaged in as a way of situating the work that you're doing. We come to the conclusion that the um, education reform has been nowhere near effective enough to get us close to all means all. And because the data, as you've just seen, show us that um, there are substantial gaps in student achievement in spite of the many reforms we've engaged in. It isn't because those reforms weren't worthwhile. We happen to believe the reforms were necessary, but they aren't sufficient to get the job done. For example, a focus on improving the quality of teaching and working with teachers to use data more effectively to meet the needs of students, that's something we weren't doing 30 years ago in this field. We're doing a lot of it now. That's worth doing, but it's not enough to get to all means all. So we have to ask the question, why didn't our reforms get us where we were going? First question to ask is, was it the wrong goal? Is all means all just too ambitious? Is it too idealistic? Is it a blue sky goal that we'll never get to in this society? And we happen to believe that for both ethical reasons, we, we have always had the obligation to do better by the next generation than was done for us in terms of creating the opportunity for them to live up to their potential. Uh, but now, given where the economy is going, our economic survival depends on educating all of our young people to a level of success that enables them to participate in a 21st century economy, enables them to be informed citizens and leaders, should they choose to be that, in our uh, political and democratic system, enables them to be heads of families with all the values and character traits we associated with, with that, and enables them to be lifelong learners, capable of solving problems that we as educators today can't even conceive. So the goal isn't wrong, but maybe the strategies were wrong. And as I said earlier about teaching, but I could say the same thing about accountability, having standards, measuring progress, uh, holding folks accountable to be sure there have been mistakes in the way some of these reforms have been implemented. But on the whole, these were smart things to try and incorporate into our world of education. 
we've added choice, we've added a focus on teaching. You know, we've, we've tried some things that were worth trying and necessary for improvement. We make a big investment in public schools, but again, not sufficient to getting the job done. So the last question that I ask is, was it the wrong delivery system? We have an education delivery system, a school system, that looks a lot like it did in the early 20th century, because that's when it was built. It was devised for a nation that in the early 20th century was rapidly growing, lots of immigrants coming in, lots of people moving from the country to the cities, uh, a huge industrial economy just getting started and growing. Um, we needed to batch process, mass produce education for a lot of people to educate and socialize them very quickly to take low-skill, low low-knowledge jobs in a factory economy that needed very few people to be leaders. So we designed a system that gave us a bell curve distribution of student achievement over a very low center. And that system served us pretty well, arguably for the first three quarters of the 20th century. We made improvements, we added a middle school, we added kindergarten, we did things differently. The graduation rate moved from maybe 10% in the early 20th century to now it's up to 80% where we are today. Uh, but it, um, it still was that same model, and that model had its limitations. One is just the, the way in which classrooms are set, <clears throat> are set up, for the most part, the same way they were in the early 20th century. But it was, it was a factory design, and, and that, was a, that was a problem. There are a number of problems with that factory design. I'll just touch on a couple quickly. <laughs> so it's one size fits all, <clears throat> right? We had... As I mentioned, the, um, the children entering kindergarten, having heard such different numbers of words, and some are behind chronologically where you might expect them to be, and some are way ahead, and yet at best we treat them all the same. We give them the same amount of time and the same length of time in school uh, as though the challenge in each case was the same, but it's really quite different. We take in immigrants <clears throat> from third world countries in middle school where they've had no background or education in core subjects in their own language. We put them in our schools, we mainstream them in our classes out of some sense of equity, and we ask them to learn core subjects that they'd never had, catch up to the other kids, keep pace with the other kids, and while they're at it, learn English. And then we wonder why the results at the end of the year come out that English language learners are having problems. Well, it's, it's obvious. One size doesn't fit all. We also have insufficient time. As you would know better than anybody as educators, schools are being asked to do everything. We're supposed to get students to world-class standards in English and math and, and science. Not sort of the bell curve that we had before, but get everybody to the high end of the bell curve. And while we're at it, give them a well-rounded education in the subjects that aren't tested, for which we aren't held accountable, but subjects like history or foreign languages or the arts or physical education or business or any, any number of other subjects. Same time, we're encouraged to think about giving them 21st century skills of collaboration and communication and creativity, things like that. Lately, there's been a lot of talk that we should <clears throat> focus on social and emotional skills like uh, grit and determination and executive function and things of that nature. And while we're at it, we have to attend to all these other factors from getting meals to getting health care um, to dealing with societal problems. So if we have a teen pregnancy problem and the rest of society can't figure out how to solve it, they say, well, let's have the schools figure that out. <laughs> you know, if there's violence in the streets, the, uh, it gets somehow flipped around and turned into being a school problem as opposed to society's problem, and school has to sort out the violence problem. Um, <clears throat> and while we're at it, anything else that's needed, uh, and driver education on top of it all. And so it's just too little time. Again, 20% of their waking hours. Six hours a day, 180 days a year. It's just not enough time. We're cramming everything into an old box that was for a different purpose in a different time, and it doesn't fit. So we have these problems like the narrowing of the curriculum. We get into these false competitions. Gee, is English more important than the arts? 
and we're going to compete over scarce time, and we get sort of convoluted about these kinds of things, and uh, we're, we're missing the point. We don't have enough time overall in this system. And the system, uh, as is evident from the earlier slides, doesn't address the impact of poverty. So uh, those are a few of the limitations of the existing system. So our contention is we need a new vision. We're in the 21st century. We can't incrementalize our way to success here. We can't keep taking this old engine that was designed to power a human capital system in the early 20th century, think of it as a Model T engine that was prepared to drive a car at 30 miles an hour, and now we're in the 21st century, we're saying we need a car that goes 100, 120 miles an hour, and we've taken that old engine and we've added a, you know, a carburetor of standards and we've strapped accountability around it, and we've added a fifth wheel for choice and a whole bunch of other things. But somehow, we've only got it up to 50 or 60 miles an hour. It won't go 100 or 120, just not built to do that. So we need a new vision. We need a way of thinking what would a system look like if it was really designed to deliver on the promise of American public education, which is excellence and equity. If we had a system that was really about all means all, if it was really about leveling the playing field so that kids from the inner city, kids from poor neighborhoods in the inner city would have every bit as much a chance to be successful in career in college as someone who grows up in an affluent suburb, what would that system actually look like? How would you build it? It's a, it's a thought question that you might want to spend some time thinking about. Of course, we're saddled with the existing system. By the way, the existing system has purposes other than education. We think of it as an education system. Uh, but guess what? It's a very popular daycare system. And if you try to change it or change the hours that it operates, you're in big trouble in most communities because we've delicately, most of us as adults and parents, balanced our lives around that system, including its assumptions like one size fits all or we only operate 20% of a children's waking hour. All that's built in. So we're all pretty conservative when it comes to changing American public education. But as a result, we're sort of lumbering into the 20th century, into the 21st century, dragging along this essentially 19th, early 20th century model with us, and it doesn't quite fit. Okay, I'm, I'm getting the time signal. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, what do we want for all children? And I'll go quickly, I'll tell you, five minutes, Tom. Uh, we, we want them to be educated, we want them to be employed, we want them to be healthy. These are the broader goals of what we're aiming to accomplish. And I, I mentioned this quickly before, so I won't belabor it again, but here are parts of that definition. We want them to be in the economy and able to support themselves and a family. We want them to be in the democracy, informed and leading. Never has it been more important in our history than now. We want them to head up our families. We want them to be lifelong learners. We want them to be fulfilled, gratified people in our society happy and engaged. So we set up this lab to advocate for this kind of vision and for the need to get there, to do field work um, out, in, out in the field to support projects like what you're doing and some others that I'll talk about in a minute, um, to do research on that work. Where is it successful for those people like yourselves who want to build systems of support and opportunity for kids who don't come by it naturally? How does that work go? What do you run into that are challenges or problems like uh, financing or the politics of it or cultural changes that are needed? Um, what, what gets in the way? What's successful? And then building a field. People like yourselves coming together in gatherings like this who say, we've got a broader conception of what we need to do in building a 21st century system of child development and education. And so, those are the things that we're at work on. Uh, we don't know exactly what the new engine ought to look like, but, but I'm, I'm going to just quickly give you three elements, three principles of design for the new engine that I think need to be there, and you'll see your own work in this. One is we've got to personalize education. We've got to customize it. We've got to have a system that meets each and every child where he or she is in early childhood and gives them what they need to be successful inside and outside of school 
so that they're successful throughout their education journey and can emerge at the end of that with some level of post-secondary education ready for success as I described it. I often use the hospital metaphor here, and this goes back to the one size fits all. We are doing in education, well, if we were doing in healthcare uh, what we do in education now, it would look like opening a new hospital and saying to everybody who comes through the front door, irrespective of your ailment, whatever's bothering you, we're going to give you the same treatment and the same stay as we give everybody else and hope that it works out for you. It's more convenient for us to offer it this way as adults, so we want to be comfortable, so that's what we're going to do. But it wouldn't work very well in public health, not that public health is the epitome of efficiency and effectiveness, with all due respect to my health colleagues here today, but it isn't working in education either. And, of course, it's much easier said than done to customize an education system to each and every child. Imagine if you were... Uh, family and you had four children and the sort of prescription for the length of the day and the length of the year and everything was different for each of your children, that would be challenging. So there are a number of practical elements, but we figured out how to deal with it in hospitals. We've got transportation systems that serve hospitals that allow people to come and go at different times. I think we can figure it out if we put our minds to it. Secondly, what you're doing here, we need to integrate services. We need to go after those impediments that get in the way of young people coming to school in the first place and being present intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally when they get there so that they can <clears throat> supply their best effort. So integrating those services, braiding, health, mental health, social services and supports, cutting, cut, you know, cutting down on those ACEs, cutting back on the toxic stress that so many kids bring to school with them. And finally, in the out-of-school learning domain, and I've already talked a little bit about that, we know what it takes. Those of us who have privilege give our kids access to those sorts of opportunities, and we need to level the playing field. Without leveling that playing field, we're not going to get to all means all. Just quickly, we're doing some work in... Uh, six cities right now, in addition to supporting the work here, but we've just started a new initiative with mayors in six cities across the country who have agreed to work on building systems, not programs, because the good news is in each of the areas I described, we've got good programs where an individual school system or school is cooperating on health matters or on customizing or personalizing education or on making out-of-school opportunities available. What we need now are systems. We need to do this at scale in a city. So we've created some laboratories where we can work in some communities to do this. So that's the nature of the challenge. We're trying to set up these labs, learn from the labs, advance the conversation, help uh, accelerate, elevate, and notice the kind of work that you're uh, doing here. Uh, I can't think of more important work uh, for us as citizens, let alone as educators, to be doing at this point. It seems to me that either we get this right, we figure this out, or we put our whole way of life at risk. And you can see the edges of that in our society right now. So we've got to figure out how to solve so that we're a lot closer to all means all than we are right now. That's going to take a, a new vision. That's going to take the kind of the work on the ground, the experimental work that you people are doing to stretch our definition of what our obligation is as a society to our young people because it's deeply in our interest to have all of them become successful. So I thank you for listening and I thank you for your work especially. <laughs>